first, uh, our first uh, commentator will be Professor Jayanta Banyapadi, who is a professor and head at, uh, of the Center for Development and Environment Policy at the Indian Institute of Management in Calcutta, and uh, best known to us here as a third cohort fellow, and we've had the, the wonderful opportunity of having him on campus this past semester. Uh, the second commentator will be uh, our colleague from the New School, uh, Tymon McPherson, who is an assistant professor of urban ecology at the Tishman Environment and Design Center. Each of them, as I mentioned earlier, will have uh, 10 minutes to provide some, some comments, and then we'll uh, turn it over to you for your questions. Yes, please. You can speak from there or here. Oh, yes, that's okay. right. Sure. Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, uh, during the last three presentations, we had, when we designed this uh, conference, we probably have uh, uh, the right starting point. The overall topic for the conference and also for the research of the third cohort members the environmental sustainability in China and India, we thought there has to be stress on the understanding of ecology. We also have to understand the environmental history of these two countries, this region, and we need on this basis to think of how new innovations can take us towards environmental sustainability. Professor Bawa started his very in-depth presentation on the Himalaya, and he talked rightly about the liquid water that intensely connects the Himalaya with these two countries. The, the second uh, presentation again talked of another dimension of environment that probably uh, is no less important than the shared waters or the Himalayan waters is the issue of urbanization. I think it is very correct to say that both the countries can, whether they actually do it or not, have the option of defining a new form of urbanization. Now, by 2050, about 80% of the Chinese will be living in cities, and about 65% of Indians will be living in cities. And how these urban areas are preconceived, actually designed, and then lived in is not laid out anywhere. And I think it is a tremendous challenge for both these two countries to follow the ideas given in the second presentation on redefining urban life, re the redefining urban ecology. I think water and urbanization are the two pivotal points on which scientific research in these two countries, institutional experiences, needs to be organized. Now, these two countries also have uh, a reasonable amount of wilderness, grasslands, less inhabited areas. And uh, by 2050, when 20% of the people in China and 
35% of people in India will live in these vast hinterlands. Who will manage these hinterlands sustainably becomes another important question which is addressed in the third presentation. Now I think in a session of ecology, I can now find that the three presentations are also ecologically linked. They cannot be separated from each other, the ideas given. And within, within, within the short time I have, I, I would say that uh, being a student of Himalayan waters for decades now, uh, I think there is a fantastic opportunity for collaboration between China and India on the understanding of Himalayan waters, whether it is Yellow, or the Yangtze, or Mekong, Salwin, Irrawaddy, Brahmaputra, Ganges, Indus. For India, Himalayan waters provide 70% of total water supply. For China, if you take the, the, the southern rivers also, the coming out, the Lanchang, then uh, Salwin, then uh, Irrawaddy, and of course, Yellow River and uh, Yangtze. They are lifelines. And here I go to the whole issue of understanding of the ecology, what is not known in the Himalaya. And it is uh, not to blame anyone, not to blame any country. These are vast areas with very little urbanization, very little uh, sort of intense scientific understanding that we today do not have what probably would be most useful, an ecological understanding of the Himalaya. And that is what Professor Bawa had been stressing. Now, climate change that gathered like a cloud slyly over 200 years has suddenly come on to us in the last 20 years, particularly after the Earth Summit in Rio as a Sandy. So Sandy is not only a product of, probably a product of climate change, but also climate change has come on to us unprepared. And Himalaya, where the basic ecological information is lacking, is unable to accept the challenge of understanding, forecasting, modeling the process of climate change and its impact. In fact, I, I have been working on the Himalayan waters and call it the black hole in world hydrology is the Himalayan waters. There is nothing known much about it. And the climate change makes it much more important to go into those details of that black hole. Coming to Professor Lucy's presentation, this is something where, though micro level, though decentralized, though community based, I think the methodology is more universal. Governments, particularly centralized, powerful governments, led by not so informed bureaucrats and technocrats, because they do not understand the scientific weaknesses of the knowledge base on which they try to develop their ad administrative approaches to natural resource management. That there are other stakeholders, there are other forms of knowledge, there are other forms of management that are needed. And I think that's a very universal approach that we have got from Professor Luzi on a very successful case in the Tibetan Plateau, but equally successful cases are almost everywhere uh, in, in many parts of the world, not only China and India. I think this, all the three papers have given us a, a, a very strong uh, push for ecology, a very strong push for understanding the gaps in knowledge not to neglect ecology as something which is limited to planting of trees alone, 
But ecology is as much challenging a topic of interdisciplinary science as much modern physics or modern chemistry is. And natural resource management, on the other hand, is as much a topic for administration, policy, and management. So I think we have got the right starting point for this uh, conference on which dimension, which direction uh, programs can take and what are the expectations speakers have expected that these new ideas can be worked out within the framework of India-China Institute to start with. And uh, I think that can be followed up. I, I congratulate all the three presenters for giving us very illuminating, powerful, and in-depth presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my work is uh, really focused on trying to understand the linkages between uh, social infrastructure, biophysical infrastructure, and built infrastructure all in the context of uh, thinking about transforming cities into more resilient forms and more sustainable forms. And I was interested, Mark, that you led off uh, with this idea of um, ecology sort of opening up uh, to the rest of the world in some way. And, and in terms of some of its U.S. roots, and the use of the term traditional ecological knowledge uh, that came up in a couple of the presentations. Um, and I found it interesting because ecology's changed, I, I think, quite dramatically in the last couple decades. And I'm not quite sure how much of what's happening right now in ecology, and I think this is really evidenced by um, Stewart's sort of summary of some of the thinking in ecology right now, it is widely known. Right? And so uh, I think there's some real potential value here in some of the new kinds of ways ecology is approaching because from my uh, sort of limited view, it seems that there, what, what ecology has done because of the urban force that is really starting to reshape the way we think about systems is that we're less thinking about ecology in the traditional sense and much more thinking about the, this more flexible idea of the system or ecosystem in such a way that you can integrate all kinds of information, right? Um, the other th point I was thinking about in that context is that the data availability is changing very rapidly. What was available to ask particular questions to try to understand how a system is working or the dynamics within a system uh, is totally changed from three years ago, which was totally different from 10 years ago. Now the kinds of resolution that we have in in especially biophysical data, but also in sort of built infrastructural data, especially in cities where this is sort of highly prioritized, uh, there's, there's a lot more ability there, I think, to think about the integration across disciplines. And what I find particularly um, inspiring within the ecological discipline is that the, as this data is changing, the methods and the sort of conceptual approaches to to how we work with those kinds of data, to ask the important questions, to ask the questions about how do you uh, design cities to be more resilient, and how do you take advantage of the fact that uh, cities aren't what cities were 30 years ago, or 70 years ago, or 100 years ago, that the kinds of cities we see now are fundamentally different. And they're driven by changes in the way people uh, behave, but it's also this linkage with technology. Just one example, we know that cell phone adoption uh, across the world is at extremely high rates, right? And just that one bit of uh, information alone is changing the way in which new cities are growing. And because of this uh, concept that uh, Stuart Pickett brought up of teleconnections, that you don't actually have to be in the urban core to have a job anymore. I mean, that, that there's a lot of commerce that happens over and across these teleconnections these, because of this particular piece of technology. And that is providing new forms of data. Uh, for example, uh, things like the number of people across India and China that are active on Facebook and Twitter. These are things that ecology, I think, is positioned to take advantage of in a way that most people, when they think of ecology as a metaphor, perhaps, would never think that we would be in, in, in this kind of space. And yet, with hundreds of millions of people putting information about what they're doing and where they're doing it, at any moment, at any time, in this data, you can download it, and you can look at it, and you can examine the dynamics of what people are doing almost in real time. I think 
we're poised to make some very significant changes. And, and by we, I don't mean ecology, but I mean in general, the, try to, the understanding of the human process, and especially in urban areas where, where people are congregated. And a, a couple points um, relative to the other, the other talks. Um, I did find the concept of the meta city very engaging. And uh, again, I think it's because uh, this, it's not just about larger cities, it's about different kinds of urban forms. The idea that the relationship, as uh, Stuart was mentioning, between urban and rural is not the same kind of relationships anymore that people have, uh, and, and the way in which um, the cities actually appear. So if you fly over in Google Earth, a new, one of these new emerging cities that are rapidly urbanizing, and they're moving from 5 million to 8 million in five years, and, and 15 million, they don't look exactly like the kinds of uh, sort of historical cities with, um, with the kinds of arrangements that they have. And I think that, that forces us to rethink what we think a city is, but it also forces us to rethink entirely some of the ways we approach even understanding what's happening within those kinds of uh, places. For my work, I find, and, and in ecology in general, especially I think in urban ecology, that there is an approach that comes out of systems theory that also sort of gives evidence to the flexibility that I think might be useful in terms of ecology engaging with some of these other questions. And the systems theory is not really an ecological theory, even though ecologists were uh, very important in the history and the development of systems theory. It's really just about systems. And I think you can think of that also um, in both as a metaphor, but also in terms of you know, particular definitions that might have meanings. But these, this, this is a, a metaphor that people can relate to in some way. And the nice thing about it is that it can be any kind of system. So it can be an urban system, or a social system, or a biophysical system. Uh, and because you can use systems theory to integrate those, that allows us to start asking questions across these disciplines. So I, I find this sort of theoretical construct very adaptable to different kinds of questions. And I think that's different than what we might think ecology is or uh, traditional ecology is. It means that we can start thinking about the relationships especially, and that's sort of the core of systems theory is looking at the relationships between different components in a system. So if we're thinking about humans and, and uh, biophysical uh, parts of the system, or we're thinking about uh, human patterns such as how people walk to work or their bicycle routes and uh, the kinds of roadways that exist to facilitate that or that don't exist and need to exist in order to facilitate that, especially in areas that don't have the kinds of infrastructure. I was, heard something in the elevator, so I guess it's eavesdropping, but uh, just, a, just last week, someone was riding up the elevator and these, these two guys were talking, and one of them said, you know, I just found out that uh, in Philadelphia, they're, um, they've been studying uh, bike traffic, again, using some of this social network data to see where people are and where are they going. And so looking at these bike pathways within the city, and they found that there was a subset of pathways over this period of time, and I didn't catch what it was, whether it was a month or a year, which actually matters in this case, but I don't know the answer to that. Uh, there was a subset of those patterns, and there's lots of patterns, very complex kind of pattern, that had been traveled over a thousand times. And because of that, of these 135 routes you can imagine looking at what are people actually doing now, not what we think they should do or sort of older ideas of how a city might be planned, but what do, what do people actually do? So the classic example of this is uh, a college campus, I think of it in the American context, but I think it's true all over, where you put in these gridded sidewalks and nobody walks on them, they walk on the pathways that cut off the corners. Uh, and so there's now information available that allows us to, I think, potentially completely th rethink the way we might design a city. And that allows us to think about it in terms of a resilient uh, context to these kinds of changes uh, and these kinds of challenges that we have that have been really well outlined by the previous speakers. One, um, one comment on the Tibetan um, plateau example is identifying threats, for example, which is uh, really well illustrated in the case of the Tibetan bunting. Uh, this is, I think, a good example of ecology in the sense that um, looking at the kinds of drivers of threats and then using that as a way to find innovative solutions to deal with those threats. I also think there's an opportunity to think about how you might widen that. And this is sort of how, let's say, taking a systems approach is flexible because you can move outward in space or downward in space. And you can move out over time. 
or you can look at static uh, points in time. And so there may be drivers that are associated uh, with, the, with the, the populations of those particular bird species that might be coming from outside that system. And if you take this kind of approach, then you might be able to start identifying some of those as well. And I've been interested in the Tibetan Plateau for uh, a long period of time and had the good fortune to spend three months in the western uh, part of the plateau. And I find the biodiversity there truly remarkable and I sort of have a question, which is, given some of the comments I've had, what, what else, what could, what does ecology need to do to think about how to better understand the changes that are happening in the Himalayan region and in Indian China in general? Um, either driven by climate change or driven by these urbanization processes or population growth, I think there's also just an open question there. Because ecology hasn't, it's not as if it's matured and it's done. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's, it's continuing to grow and I think one of the things that we have not learned yet is how to take advantage of local knowledge, how to actively include participatory processes in our research. And there are good examples of how that's being done, but as a whole, these are, these are things that we can still learn from. And I really appreciate the grassland example for sort of showing that uh, example and the importance of that in the conservation. And if I can take 30 more seconds, the payment for ecosystem services uh, idea here, um, I also found really useful because if that's working well, that could, that could be a model for thinking about how payment for ecosystem services might work in other kinds of locations. But I also, uh, wonder what happens if the drivers aren't local, if you use, for example, remote sensing imagery to look at the conservation uh, and whether the conservation is working and then a, uh, attribute payment based on that, and yet if the drivers are, say, global in nature or largely more regional, then it may not be the fault of poor management in some sense. Some things may not be that easy to manage. So there's some interesting questions to consider there too. Thank you. Thank you for that pair of very, uh, very useful remarks. Uh, before we turn it over to questions, I just wanted to see if the panelists had any, um, anything to say first by way of response to either of the two commentators. Uh, I'll just uh, um, respond to your mm -hmm. last point of the global change that as a driver to the grassland degradation, which is, um, I think, although the knowledge has not been really created yet, but uh, the guess, the, 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 the hypothesis is that, that the land degradation has largely, uh, is largely associated to it, mainly because of water pattern mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. um, so again, building a healthier, you know, protecting the healthier ecosystem would build the resilience to the global change. Uh, we, we might not be able to do much about the global right, change, right. but uh, uh, a better ecosystem may, may provide better resilience. That's totally the yeah, yeah. idea. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, we, we do have a pair, I believe, of ro roaming mics, and uh, we'll just raise your hand. We'll take a, we'll see how many questions there are at the outset and probably take them in, in small groups. Um, Sophia, can you go to, uh, here to, to Professor Ling? I saw her hand first. Um, please introduce yourself uh, for those here and at home. Oh, I was going to say uh, okay. Professor, Professor Ling. Ling. Yes, oh, thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, you're now in the queue, absolutely. Uh, hi, my name is Lily Ling. I teach in the graduate program in international affairs here. Uh, I was really um, very um, enlightened by all of your presentations, and I appreciate it very much and want to thank you for all of your work. Um, I noticed that cutting across all of the presentations, there was an emphasis on knowledge and knowledge production. And there was also um, a value placed on local knowledge. However, I would like to push that a little bit and ask whether you consider understanding the philosophy behind local knowledge, not just collect no local knowledge as kind of data sources. Because if you only collect local knowledge, then you're still working within an instrumental philosophy regarding the local people. Um, if you value the local community and local participation, then you must take seriously how 
they look at the world, not just what they know about the world. And so I wonder whether there is a consideration of the local community's philosophies about the world and how you are taking that into consideration. And why is it that throughout these presentations we have not heard about the local philosophies, rather we resort to say scientific terms like ecology. Thank you. Okay, I'll take a, a couple of more questions. Um, yes, Professor Chakrabarti here. I am Ranjan Chakraborty from Kolkata, India. Uh, I, I like Professor Bandopadhyay's expression uh, that the Himalayas uh, is the black hole of Asian hydrology. You said something like that. Uh, and uh, Professor Bawa remarked that in the Himalayas, the temperature has gone up to 1.5 degrees. Now, my friend uh, Iqbal Hasnain, he has studied the glaciers, the Himalayan glaciers. I hope you know Professor Hasnain. And it is an established fact that all the glaciers, Himalayan glaciers, they have reduced remarkably in size over the last 30, 40 years. So, in mountainous terrain, even one degree rise in temperature can uh, exert disasters, uh, disasters impact. Uh, <clears throat> but coming to that point of climate change, is there any, uh, any real shift? I mean, we are talking about climate change. We are talking about the uh, carbon footprint. And for, for five years, uh, we have been talking about it. But we are still burning fossil fuel with more vigor you know, the ancient Greeks uh, started burning fossil fuels 5,000 years ago, and we are continuing with it. So what is the answer? I mean, uh, I don't know. We are talking about growth and uh, thinking about the possibility of expansion of cities in the future, 70% people living in the cities, 30% in the countryside. But you see, this is a question which has to be addressed more seriously. We will run out of water if there is no reservoir, there's no frozen water in the Himalayas. I mean, this is a very serious issue. I don't know whether there will be growth, there will be a sharp decline. I mean, th this is not a particular question addressed to any of the panelists, but this is a, th a, a thought I'm sharing with you. What is the answer to this question of climate change and global warming? Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take one more question from Professor Lee over here. Yeah. Uh, I'm the fellow of second cohort, <coughs> Li Bo. Um, I guess I just want to express a sense of um, both hope and, and, and uh, anxiety. Uh, even though the, the understanding of ecology might change and expand, but I think there is a very fundamental uh, concept that urban ecology is exploiting resources from elsewhere and polluting um, a lot of other places. Um, no matter how open-minded we become and how technology can make us feel virtually connected and inspired and uh, collaborate, the very concept of um, concrete and the metal forest that we create that we don't even allow water to go through the system in the urban areas and we um, use nat continuously use natural resources to produce things um, it's interesting to see for instance the metaphor of iPhone iPhone really stand as a tool in our hands that make us urban population extremely powerful. But even that needs heavy metals, needs a lot of natural resources that are drilling from many different places. And in the process of taking those resources and in the process of producing them and then discarding them when the new brand comes up. I think 
let us not underestimate the amount of urbanization and its impact, especially in Asia. Um, it might be a curse as well. Uh, earlier, one of the presenters said about the, the dams, uh, you know, in the systematic epic centers around the Himalaya, there are so many dams to be built just in order to supply cities. That's one thing. And another point is, let us also not underestimate the, the fragility and the irre irreversibility of the, the, the high temperate areas where urbanization is becoming vertical. We use, for instance, the technology that we use to treat our sewage water probably doesn't work there in the winter that I have personally come across. So I think this two point are, is what I want to express. Thank you. Let's uh, have our panelists respond to any or all of those three uh, very good questions and comments. Come on. I just want to respond to all these three quick comments very, very quickly. I think uh, you have a very good point about traditional knowledge. I think in our case, and I can elaborate that later, uh, if there is enough time, uh, traditional knowledge is not really collecting tr traditional knowledge for publication and documenting that traditional knowledge. In our projects, traditional knowledge forms the basis for natural resource management and policy making in that area. And I can elaborate on that. Uh, but, but the point is very well taken, and I think you are absolutely right. So it's not, we are not using traditional knowledge just to study traditional knowledge. It's much beyond that. And as, as uh, Dr. Du pointed out, in any area when you go for natural resource management policies or implementation of plans, you have to first understand what people are doing and what people are thinking and what sort of management system they have in place. In our case, we have looked at the grasslands, again, in very high altitude, how people are managing those grasslands, and they have very, very good strategies to, for rotation and for migration and, and local institutions to manage those resources. So, so we are trying to understand that to, to sort of slow down some of the things coming from the centralized authorities. So that is the whole purpose. Uh, in, in question to you know, your, uh, your question about uh, solutions to climate change, I think we know what the solutions to climate change is. And I think you can answer that question as well as uh, I can. All I want to say is we should not think, you know, that the society defines these terms, sustainability and climate change and all that. It should not be the burden of ecologists to come and then elaborate on those concepts. So it's a, it, it, it's a burden that has to be shared by everybody. And third, urbanization, I would leave it to Stuart. I do want to express my opinion about urbanization. People talk about urbanizations and ills of urbanization, but let's also try to understand urbanization is a very, very efficient system for using energy and all sorts of resources. There is no other system which can be as efficient. You know, if you scatter people all over the world, there would be, uh, we would be in much poorer shape than we currently are. Well, uh, why don't we take local, uh, local people's philosophies into account? I had 20 minutes and I'll just assure you that there are people with whom I work in urban areas or in some of the, the um, conservation areas that I've been involved in who are engaged in, in understanding the, the ethical structures in the, the local communities, whether it's an underserved neighborhood in Baltimore or, or um, some of the dense settlements on the, the boundary of Kruger National Park, for example. So in the, the, the community of people who are studying <coughs> and working with these communities, there are people who, who have that knowledge and work with it. That's not my expertise. And I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm, I, 
I went into ecology because I was the uncomfortable teenager and a lot of, un so, and the people who do the other things went into the, the study of society and demographics because they didn't have that social handicap, but we worked together and, and try to get, get the conversation going. Um, the business about how to deal with the, the resource availability that we're up against, this is one of the things that, that people argue um, and have argued constantly. Will technology overcome the limits? Right now, we're, we're, we're feeding the world on, on something like 40% more agricultural production because production because we're turning oil into food, essentially. How long can you keep turning oil into food? Uh, and, and the question has, there are, there are whole ranges of ways to answer it. Um, one answer is that, well, you can't continue it forever. The, the business about um, hope and anxiety and, and what we might call the urban footprint, I'll, I'll point to an example of, of um, there's a famous sustainable agriculturalist in the United States by the name of Wes Jackson, and he has a farm that he tries so hard to make self-sustaining. He can't do it. So it's not, we shouldn't just blame cities. It's people, it's the number of people, and it's how we choose to live. And to go back to being the uncomfortable teenager again, um, we, we have to, as, as a global community, think about that. It's, it's, the, it's people, how many of us there are, and how we choose to live. I'll uh, try to respond to some of the, uh, the, 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 the question on the local culture as a, as a philosophy, not uh, just the information uh, as a you know, management strategy. Um, I think I only had 20 minutes, so I didn't elaborate on that point. Um, the, recognize the value of lo local knowledge and local values, cultural value into conservation, which is something that's uh, accepted by the government, I think is, is a first step. But behind that is really the appreciation to people's choices. Um, that's based on philosophy. And that's probably also associated to what Li Bo had just talked about in terms of choice of lifestyle. Um, what I think there are many models to talk about, you know, urbanization and efficiency of cities, et cetera. Um, that is based on the assumption that uh, the consumption will increase or the demand for consumption will grow. But uh, there are people that don't mind to live in a very basic lifestyle. I think what's missing, what's wrong with this world is that those people were basically, especially if it's these people were our traditional people, are basically overwhelmed by the modernization and development. But development for what was, was remain as a question. Didn't, no, no, I, think, I don't think the world actually answered that, que that question well. Um, why would, do we develop? Actually, when we uh, discuss with um, the local communities on what development choices we have, and this often we got into the stage that uh, people question that, uh, why do we need more wealth, more money um, at the cost, with, at the cost of destroying the land? So that is a, some fundamental issues. I think um, it may not be reliable because I think another side of human nature is material, you know, is uh, enjoying the material goods. I mean, like the boom, um, um, boom box I just showed. Um, but there is, an, I think people are complex. So when it gets to spiritual, which often doesn't sound very reliable, 
at least we give, give some space to that kind of demand, that kind of requ requirement. Uh, so slowing down sometimes uh, may not be a bad choice, um, at least. Thank you. Uh, Professor Sanjay Chaturverdi, and then here in the... Anyone else? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm a third cohort fellow at the India-China Institute. My question is to Professor Lu uh, Ji. You talked about eco-settlements, um, and if you look at the government discourse, they are using the language of eco-migrations. So there is this politics of language here. I was wondering whether there is a resistance to it, you know, when also the nomadic communities are forced to become territorialized. Uh, and if there is a resistance, then in what terms and through what strategies that resistance is being articulated? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, here. Uh, wait till you get the mic. In the this is Prabhakaran. Uh, I edit an online monthly called the East West Inquirer. My question may be somewhat related to what this gentleman raised here. Uh, the climate change, we all know it is real, but there is a conflict within the scientific community. They are not, uh, all are in agreement with that opinion in the sense that in this country especially, there's a powerful conservative uh, media led by the Wall Street Journal editorial page, almost come out with articles saying that, to the effect that, it is a figment of liberal imagination. They can't accept the data, the tons of data available in support of our argument that climate change is very real and we have to find a solution expeditiously. The solution is made impossible because of the conflict within the scientific community, your opinion. Anyone can take that, thank you. Thank you, and here. Hello, my name is Eric Godoy. I'm a PhD candidate in philosophy here. Um, thank you all for beautiful talks, visually and intellectually. Um, my question's mostly directed to Professor Pickett, um, but maybe you can all respond to it. Uh, you spoke of the usefulness of metaphor, um, and I was wondering about also, uh, metaphor can be dangerous when it's taken out of its you know, scientific concepts meant to describe one set of phenomena stretched beyond that, and so social Darwinism might be a, a good example of that. So since we're all probably from different backgrounds here and, and writing on this, I'm wondering if you could maybe point out some concepts that um, we should be cautious with and stretching beyond their, their bounds uh, with a useful meaning. Thanks. Okay, we had uh, three questions. Let's get some responses, and then we'll get, get the next batch. Can I do that one? Since of course. I actually will remember it. <laughs> <laughs> the way metaf metaphor is useful, and it's a problem, as as you point out. There are lots and lots of metaphors in science. Almost every, if you, you open the uh, table of contents of any ecological textbook, and you look at the titles of the chapters, the terminology will almost always have originated from the vernacular. And so it has, it has uh, cultural and experiential loading. And one of the things that we have to do is when we're doing our job the best is to, to unpack those loadings and to be very clear about the models that we are going to work with and with which we're going to uh, communicate with other specialists and with decision makers. The metaphor is often the, the entry point. Evolution is a metaphor. The unrolling, to unroll something. What does that mean? I mean, that sounds like there's a place it's going or pre preordained plan wrong. Um, succession, the king is dead, long live the king. That's not how communities or ecosystems develop. Competition, well, there's one that's loaded. Um, so, I mean, we've just all, all of, almost every ecological concept that you might usefully communicate about has a loaded metaphor up front. 
and you have to unload these things, watch out for the philosophies that are, are being uh, engaged or ignored, and then be very clear about the models. Uh, there was a really nice article in the New York Times a few days ago by uh, Paul, um, Paul Krugman about models in economics, and I read that and I thought, geez, this is the same thing as in ecology. respond to the question on eco-migration. Uh, it does exist. Um, in this area I just mentioned, Sanjiangyuan, there has been 50,000 people moved out um, with compensations and houses built by the government. Um, several things. One is the, the payment is too little to sustain, so this population becomes poor. And the two, um, the, the intention was to move these people out so the land left uh, ungrazed. I mean, the ban of grazing is, is based on the uh, relocation of people. But um, the reality is that um, um, many of the houses didn't really move out completely. Only a proportion of pop the family moved out. I think... Um, so, so as a result of the government policy that failed, the, the ban was not really applied because of lack of capacity of monitoring, it, so it's, it's let be. Um, one problem with the eco-migration is I think a proportion with the population growth, the po proportion of the population moving out may not be, may be inevitable, uh, necessary actually, but uh, moving people all out may not be a good strategy uh, because the land, it, from experience from other parts of the grassland in China is that moving people out, local people out, may lead the, to the consequences that other outsiders coming in to exploit the land. These people do not have history or ancestral connection or any passion toward the land, so they came for money. That's worst the worst scenario. So if we had a choice, I think keeping some people on the land to protect, uh, play as a, a role as a protector uh, is probably the best choice. So that's why in the new policy, in the next round of five-year policy, uh, the recommendation was to voluntarily, with, with incentives, move people, some people out, but uh, uh, do not exclude people from the land. Uh, I just wanted to comment on climate change again. You know, I don't want to sound like uh, we are trying to avoid questions about climate change and solutions to climate change. Uh, two comments, or three comments. First of all, I don't think there is any debate within the scientific community about climate change. There is, in general, debate about society. There are always people on the fringes uh, and so we, we can't be, uh, you know, scientists will never agree 100%, but we can discuss that later too. Now in terms of what to do about climate change, of course we all know what to do about cl climate change, and climate change is not going to resolve unless collective action is taken. And I think the point about, uh, which I couldn't really describe fully, the, uh, the, the article I wrote, China, India, and the environment, it was not dealing with environment in India independently of environment in China. The point was that two countries have to collaborate. They have to cooperate because they are the sort of major contributors to some of the global change problems. And the secondly, they share common borders and the Himalayas we are talking about. And I think it, this institute, the, the China-India program here, they are scholars from India, they are scholars from China, I would imagine. And I think it provides such a good opportunity really to deal with these issues, you know, how this collaboration and cooperation can be fostered, how the two countries can trade environmental security for the elusive territorial security or political security they are, they are seeking in this you know, conflict over border. And you go to these very vast areas that are not populated 
and you see the armies facing each other and the tremendous amount of degradation that is going on. But apart from that, you know, they, they do have a common th thinking when they gather together on the World Forum on climate change issues. They have a lot in common. They have a lot to learn from, from each other. Traditional knowledge on either side of the border. There are a number of things, and this is what is pointed out in the article. So that's where I would say, you know, maybe, maybe there can be a beginning made in that area, and then perhaps that can lead to a, a large collective action. Wait, 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 just, I'm sorry, we, okay, we can't hear you though. No one can hear you. Uh, very brief, please. Uh, very brief, yeah. When I said a conflict within the scientific community, I'm not saying that 50% scientists are opposed and 50% of the scientists are in support of what we are saying. Maybe two scientists on the other side who are opposed to our views, general views, there are people who even say, scientists, and uh, media like the Wall Street Journal editorial page quote that those two scientists to advance their theory that uh, it is not real. And again, whatever uh, it, it has an impact, adverse impact on economic growth, conservative media in this sure. country are opposed to that. I'm sorry. All right. Um, I want to recognize now uh, Professor Shir Kui Dong, who is one of our ICI fellows from China, as was Professor Tato Verdi, whose previous question was asked. And then, Nidhi, you're next. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Shikui Dong from China. Uh, thank you very much, through, uh, presenters. You are, uh, really addressed a lot to the issue across Himalaya region. So uh, actually, maybe my, um, uh, it's not the right time to again ask the question about the climate change, but uh, I would like to uh, learn more from Professor Baba. Uh, I'm not sure, because you are showing uh, the, the data from scientific point of view, there's a Girl, there's clearly a trend set showing that uh, both the temperature and uh, precipitation are growing uh, in Himalaya region. But uh, I did a lot, uh, some kind of, uh, let's say, social service on uh, local herders. Um, uh, by the way, I'm the grassland ecologist doing a lot of uh, research across uh, Himalaya region, especially on uh, Ayapaka grassland. So my question is actually, a lot of people, they are feeling there's a lot of vulnerability, uncertainty of uh, uh, climate change. Like when I visit uh, Himachal Prabhadish, a lot of people said, some years there are more uh, precipitation, some uh, years there are less. So they feel very much difficulties to cope with this kind of situation. And also in uh, uh, China side, when we did some study in Nachi, also Sanjiang Yuan area, in some places, actually, they are becoming drier and drier year by year. Some areas become colder, like not we did some survey on the local herd. They said, oh, in, we did have very cold uh, winter in these years. So I'm thinking, is there a kind of a gap between the local knowledge and the scientific knowledge, or we are missing something? Thank you. Okay. Yes, Nidhi. Uh, my name is Nidhi Srinivas. I'm also from the ICI third cohort. Uh, my, my question is a general one <clears throat> and addressed to all of you. A common thread across your presentations is a presumption. I say that, ironically, that ecology is a science. Uh, I'm quite sympathetic to this idea, largely for the reasons that Mr. Prabhakar, Prabhakar mentioned. I would really like to not think of global warming as a left liberal consensus that's paranoid driven. So I do see ecology as a science. But you are also sensitive to the fact that ecology has to persuade people. Uh, science persuades in different ways. One is through facts, and the other, as uh, Stuart Pickett mentioned, is through metaphors. So my question, which will seem a broad one, is really this. What aspects of ecology are metaphorical? Is global warming a metaphor? Is carbon sink a metaphor? That goes back to Sanjay Chaturvedi's question on language. What aspects of, um, uh, of ecology at the moment are not really a science? For instance, uh, would any of you be comfortable stating the areas in terms of the Himalayas where we actually cannot say with clarity there is deforestation taking place? Um, and the reason I ask this is because I'd really like to establish to what extent we can see ecology as a science. As an outsider who does a lot of study of social ecology uh, and study social resilience, I, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable looking at ecology as only a science. Uh, however, I'm extraordinarily uncomfortable letting go of that uh, as well. 
<laughs> okay, yes, and a question here in the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Miles Aiken. I'm a sportsman, international sportsman, and I uh, used to teach uh, the limits to growth about 30 years ago. I live day by day, so 30 sounds about right. My question to the par uh, panel and the members of the, of the audience is, uh, did any of you take part in Black Friday? Um, maybe some of you didn't know. Uh, does everyone on the panel know what Black Friday is? Yes, Black Friday, we just had it in New York, didn't we? Where we all go materialistically early in the morning to grab, 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 grab. So, but I think that's what happens. Yes, sir, right there. So, did, have any of the panel taken part in Black Friday here in New York? And if you've not, could, is there a Black Friday in India, in which, in Mumbai, for example? Or is there a Black Friday in Beijing? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, there is. Oh, right. Oh, right. So globalization is working. Uh, so, so, um, so would you, so if any of you took place, took part in Black Friday in India, in China, could you tell me if you had any um, uh, feelings of remorse for taking part in it, being an ecologist? And last but not least, um, in India, we know about this amazing man, which I'm marveling each day about, Mahatma Gandhi who made some very interesting comments that relate to this conference ages before. Is there anyone in Chinese history that had similar thoughts about ecology comparable to Mahatma Gandhi? And could you pass that on to me? And then at the end of the conference, could you let me know what the dates are of Black Friday is in India and China? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Panelists, three more good questions. Uh, I think in terms of the very good question about the climate change variability, I think the data I presented is an average over all eco-regions over a 25-year period. There is a lot of variability, both in terms of time and space, and we haven't analyzed those data yet, uh, but we do intend to analyze, and so, so there is a lot of variability. I think the other question about ecology as a science I, I think it's my fault. I think I couldn't articulate my viewpoint. My whole point was that ecology is not a science. And I, I, and I think this is my fault because I was not able to express myself very clearly. And I think in the panel discussion too, I think your comment, I think, you know, I consider ecology as a somewhat a oxymoron term. You know, it's not, it's not in a way it's relevant, but in the context of Stuart pointed out, I think you know, it's the human impact on the environment. That's a dominant theme. And those human in impacts on the environment cannot be studied by ecologists alone, and not only by the traditional approaches ecologists have, fo uh, have followed. I think, I think this came up several, several uh, in almost all the three dis discussions and all the, all the two panel comments. And I would leave the Black Friday question uh, <laughs> onwards to the <laughs> two members. <laughs> this is a, a quite a bunch of questions here. <laughs> uh, the, is e ecology a science? Well, to productively follow on that, I would probably have to ask you, what do you mean by science? Science um, is a metaphor. Science is a metaphor. Science is a metaphor. Well, with life, we live, we communicate by metaphors. It's just, it's metaphors all the way down to misquote the anthropologists. Um, but, but what you do in science with this metaphorical door in and the metaphorical door out, what you do in science is you, you state as clearly as you can your expectations. Your expectations may be driven by self-interest, they may be driven by stupidity, they may be driven by money, but your job is to be as clear as you can about what your expectations are and then confront observations, experiments, and comparisons in the material world with those expectations and as honestly and openly as you can say, did it work or not? If it didn't work, then you have to reject it or revise it. That's science. Now, you can argue about what the social meaning 
of that match between your expectations and, and your, your, uh, your data are. And the, there's always, the, the philosophers talk about, well, never mind, we won't go into that. But there's, um, the, the data and the models never match exactly. So there's always some room to argue. There's always some uncertainty in, in the degree of match. So what you do then is you, ha you generate the greatest confidence based on the number of different independent studies, the di number of different independent lines of evidence. Now that's what I mean by science. Now that doesn't mean that all scientists are saints, and it doesn't mean that all scientists, scientific conclusions are absolutely certain. What it does mean is that the Wall Street Journal is being terribly disingenuous in, in trying to convince people that climate change is bogus. Yes, there are some people out there, some, some people with PhDs out there who, who don't think that climate, ch climate change is a reality. Okay, that's true. Um, the consensus, why do, why do I accept climate change? Because it fits with some fundamental theories about how the world works that have been demonstrated to be adequate explanations for a couple hundred years. The mechanisms are clear. The relationships to the human history is clear. So there, for, if, there, if somebody tries to tell you that climate change is not happening, you can find uh, lots of scientific justification. And you can find a few people who will say no. Now, what to do about that is a matter of, it's a so, that's a social discourse. I, as a scientist, can, I can't tell you what to do. I, that's, a, that's a political decision, a social decision that we all have to do that takes into account um, livelihoods and, 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 and philosophies and, and traditional eco ecological and local ecological knowledge. That's a very important point you made. Yeah, not, right, right, yeah. It's not in the hands of the people. Really. And ecology has a place in that, at, at that table. Ecology as the science has a place at that table. But when you, you, when you walk into that room, people are kind of going to try to destroy you um, because it's in their self-interest to do so. And they'll tell you about social construction of science. But there's fundamentally, science is about whether expectations which are clearly articulated are met or not in, in the material world. I probably should shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> On science, um, it's interesting because in China we, we emphasize from the government to people, to the society that emphasize science very highly, overly uh, emphasizing the word science which almost science becomes the substitute to correctness. Um, I don't know about India, mm -hmm. is that the same? Worship to science, the word science. So a lot of uh, bad things down under the name of science actually. So, so I'm, <laughs> um, uh, as Professor Pickett uh, mentioned, that uh, it's a matter of your expectation. It's a matter of government's expectation. It's a matter of people's expectation to science. Um, but uh, to me, I think science also means attitude of openness that allow different, allow different opinions and allow non-mainstreamed opinions as well. So I, um, on the Black Friday, I don't know if anything <laughs> like Li Bo or Feng Xi can. Every day is Black Friday. In Beijing, okay. in Beijing we have about 20% for clear days. Mm -hmm. So rest of them are Black Friday. <laughs> and, and this is while we're uh, gathering the next question, let me just say that um, I think this is a way of indicating that tomorrow morning, uh, bright and not so early, uh, 10 o'clock, you're welcome to come for light breakfast at 9.30, but at 10 o'clock, we have a history panel, and I'll ask our panelists, uh, Professor uh, Shapiro Hughes and 
uh, Chakrabarty to consider tonight whether there is a, a, a counterpart to uh, Gandhi in China <laughs> as far as that goes. Um, I think we'll also perhaps hear about uh, uh, some, some uh, abuses of science, at least as, as I'm familiar with Professor Shapiro's work in the, in the Maoist period. Uh, we have a question in the back, yes. Uh, my name is uh, Xi Feng from Horizon Research Consultants and Group. We are also ICI's partner in China. Now, I'm just responding to Professor Lu Li's question on Black Friday. Uh, in China, my answer is yes and no, because first I say no. We, we don't have a Black Friday, because that happens the first day right after the fourth, you know, last Thursday of the fourth week. No, we don't have this one. But we do have another, I think the board mentioned in China, we call Singles Day. That's uh, November 11th. But on that oh, yeah. day, because yeah. this year, I'll just give you one number. Uh, Tianmo, I think the sales went crazy. You know, the total volume sales, I think in Chinese, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, 19.7 billion Chinese yuan. You know the largest mall in Beijing is called, where is that last one? You know, it's, it's one day sales, it's five years sales of that biggest mall in Beijing. It's, where is it? No, not Jingyuan, it's uh, near the <laughs> Guomo, going to the east. So that says something, but that, I would say that day in China, would be comparable to Black Friday uh, because I don't know, and there, there's an increased number of singles in China. Yeah, I think. As we, as we have. But that big sales day in China, uh, the singles day sale is uh, actually is less polluted because all the sales are done on the internet. Online. <laughs> but the shipping companies, they are busy because they are producing pollutions because they have to deliver all the boxes. And uh, well, that's just my quick response. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. And please introduce yourself. Thanks very much. I, it's a bit brazen for me to ask a question because I was teaching all day and I apologize for arriving late. But I do have a, a, a question for Pro Professor Pickett. Um, I haven't uh, heard him in person in 15 years when you last addressed a conference at the New York Botanical Garden with your theories about chance and uh, <laughs> serendipity in ecological systems. And my, my question is this, it's not related to global warming or Black Friday, quite frankly. It's related to what has recently, what have been recently called chimeric organisms. We're now in an era where uh, everyone knows we're able to alter the structure on a, a minute molecular level of <coughs> cells in living organisms. And we're also on the verge of creating new organisms and injecting them into the ecology, which is called synthetic biology. And my question to you, since I've, I've been teaching your articles for years, um, is I know that you've addressed stochastic processes, ch chaotic, the, the role of chaos and disequilibria in ecological systems, but I've never had the chance to interrogate you, as it were, and ask you, what do you think of these new developments in, in the constitution of cellular and synthetic cellular life, and uh, whether you have any concerns um, as a theorist of chance and serendipity, whether you've ever um, addressed these new <coughs> emerging features of ecosystems. Thanks. Those are important issues, and what I'm going to have to be, I'm going to have to be fair and say that I haven't studied those. So my opinion is not particularly going to be <coughs> useful on that. However, 
um, using something called the precautionary principle, which in the absence of information is the, the, the first resort. Um, careful thought, careful study w really needs to be, um, those things need to be thought through very, very carefully. And in, in the year, which is the 50th anniversary of Silent Spring, where arguments were um, advanced by certain sectors in society about arguments against the synthetic chemicals that were being broadcast, um, it, 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 that suggests why I'm pointing to the, the precautionary principle, even though I don't have personal knowledge, really, of, of those kinds of compounds. So I'm going to be fair and say we need to think more. We need to study more. Anyone else? If not, then please join me in applauding this very wonderful panel.